What's the story, guys? Welcome to What Happens Here, Las Vegas' newest sports and entertainment program. We got another episode happening. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. <clears throat> Thanks for coming along today. Actually, I was just having a little bit of a conversation with a gentleman that I'm interviewing straight after this, and he said the last time they did a podcast was back in 1992 with Larry King. So I feel very, very privileged today to be able to talk to this man. As I said before, when I started this podcast, I wanted to talk to some really interesting people that had some great stories. Some of you may know who they are. Some of you may know who they're not. But don't take it from me. Check this out. Would you please welcome to the podcast today, Mr. Steve Loft. What's up, brother? Not much, but all of those were without makeup, too. So you have to remember that. You know, they didn't get makeup on until early 2000s. How do you feel when you see those photos? Uh, very emotional. You know, it's uh, uh, like having a brother uh, who you're very close with, and then all of a sudden you're not with them anymore. And uh, uh, it becomes very emotional, especially after being under the pressure of being responsible for that particular person, for Mike particularly, from 84 to 88, he was the most valuable sports property in the world. And I was fortunate to be placed in a position by the bosses to say, it's your job to make sure everything goes right. So uh, I don't know how Mike handled it, but he was under tremendous pressure. He never showed it. I was dying, but fortunately it worked out. Well, thanks for coming to the podcast today. I do appreciate you coming on. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the, the interview that I just had before here was with the world's leading expert on Sasquatch. Wow, that must have been a barely interesting interview. It, actually, to be quite honest, it was an amazing interview. And then and I knew you were coming in here straight afterwards. So I'm hoping it's going to be as enticing and as informative as my interview with the, the Bigfoot researcher. Well, let's put it this way. I hope I don't have as much hair on my legs as he did. Well, no, Michael's got more hair on his back than a normal Sasquatch. <laughs> he, he, he kind of, he's the Las Vegas uh, Bigfoot that walks around here. But anyway, welcome to the show, bro. Thanks for coming on. How are you feeling? I'm feeling terrific. The drugs do wonders, you know. <laughs> you do enough cocaine and marijuana, the heroin is a plus, you know. <laughs> and I got a great deal on used needles. <laughs> yeah, yeah two, really. No, two for one. They're a little bent, but they're still good, you know. Well, you see, when uh, when I was told about this interview today, um, I was told it was going to be one of those conversations where it's going to go either one way or the other. Normally, I prepare for these kind of interviews, but today I thought, you know what? What the hell? Um, not only am I going to be drinking whiskey today, but I'm just going to go off the bat. I'm going to go organic. I'm going to go natural. And I'm going to talk to this man. We're going to have a normal conversation. Are you from here in Vegas? Uh, originally, I'm from New York City, from the Bronx. And uh, I was born there in 1950, went to uh, public schools there. Uh, Mom and dad were middle class people. Uh, grew up on, believe, interestingly enough, on the same street that Customato, Mike's trainer, grew up on. I went to the same school as Customato went to. And we were born on the same day that Customato was born on. Uh, so I grew up in the Bronx and uh, I wasn't into sports in any way, shape, or form back then. Uh, just school, until my uncle taught me to play a sport called handball. It's like racquetball, but you use your hands. Yeah, right? in Australia we play that a lot okay. as well, with the tennis and ball. Yeah. I became enamored, and uh, the only thing I wanted to do was play handball and practice and dream about beating my uncle in handball. But that became my life for the forever after that, was handball. So the name's Steve Lott. You know a lot. You've been around a lot. You've seen a lot. You mentioned Customato. Um, a lot of people that may know who he is, if anyone that isn't uh, familiar with Mike Tyson, Gus D'Amato was obviously his trainer from back in the day when Mike became this phenomenal figure in sports and boxing. Um, can you tell us how you guys got to meet? Well, during the, uh, I started working with uh, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton in the early 70s. Uh, Jim was the world's handball champion. He was my mentor in handball. Uh, he was also the film editor for this company called Big. So, so ha ha handball was actually something that, that you actually really took on as a sport. A sport. I, I, I played around the country in every boondock town. Wow. wow. Had 
YMCA's. Wow. And every YMCA had handball courts. Yeah. And it was huge in the 30s, 40s, 50s, before health clubs and before the uh, fitness craze. Uh, Jim was the world's champion, and he was my mentor. But he also was the uh, uh, co-owner of a company that owned all the five films in the world. And when I no longer wanted to concentrate on uh, uh, handball, I asked him for a job to be the film editor. And I knew that that's what he really wanted was someone editing the films mm. who knew what part of the film was exciting. Film editors came, but they didn't want to learn about the sport. Right. They, and if they don't know about the sport, then how are they going to know which, which parts to put in the movie, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, a fight back then was 15 rounds, three minutes around, four, that's 45 minutes. That's about 2,000 feet. Mm. Now, this is before digital anything. Yeah, it was all film. Two big cranks, yep. a movie scope. You saw something, pair of uh, scissors, you cut it, splicer, making it a 10 minute reel, wow. one by one by one by mail. Mm. But I knew Jim wanted to be a fight manager. But while he was doing the film editing, he couldn't spend his time going after fighters. During that entire time period in the 70s, he and his partner were funding the training camp for Customato. Uh, Jim and Cus were very close. And whenever Cus got a fighter, he would call them and say, I got a kid, he's gonna be something. And they probably said, great, Cus, let us know. Year by year by year. Um, I was editing the films, Jim and Bill were doing the uh, uh, managing of fighters. It really didn't begin until 1978 uh, when they took on a great fighter named Wilfred Benitez, who was a junior welterweight champ. Geez, we're going right back there now, yes. aren't we? We're going right back to the yeah. beginning. And then uh, right after that, uh, a fighter named Edwin Rosario, but in 1980, Cus called and said, I got a kid, he's gonna be something. And that kid was Mike Tyson. And how old was Mike then? Uh, 13 years old. And a very bad kid from, from Brooklyn. And, very you, bad. and you knew him at that age, Steve? I, I did not. Okay. Uh, I, I rarely, maybe once every two years, I went to Catskill. I was traveling with world champions, so nobody in 1980 knew Mike Tyson. Not one manager, not one promoter, not one fight guy. It took years for Cus, in his mind, to see the vision of what Mike could become. And he knew that even though Mike was a bad kid from Brooklyn, it wasn't his personality. It was because of the people around him. And Cus knew he can break that down to get to the real person underneath, and he was right. So was Cus psychic? How did he see this in, if, if Mike was such a, um, a misfit, how did he see this skill when, it, from the beginning? You have to be brilliant. That's, yeah. that's the question. Like, how did he do it? Well, after seeing fighters for 50 years yeah, true. and growing up in the Bronx and being involved in a sport, boxing, in the 50s, where a organization called the IBC, International Boxing Club, controlled all of boxing in the way that if all the organizations today, the WBA, WBC, IBF, all joined to be one, the IBC was more powerful than they were all put together. Right. Cus brought them down by himself. Wow. So he knew fighters, he knew the um, mentality of the fighters, he knew that boxing was 30% physical, but 70% mental and emotional. Right. He watched, he studied, not like a trainer would just watch a fight or an audience, somebody in the audience watch a fight. Wow, that's a great punch. Cus wouldn't look at that. He'd look at what the, where the punch came from. Why was it thrown like that? Where was the other guy? Why did it land? What effect did it have? What was the guy thinking before and after? The mentality of like a heart surgeon would look under a microscope and examine the heart. That's how Cus examined fighters. Now, how old was Cus back then? Uh, 70 years old. Back in the day when he first started with Mike. When he Mike in 1980, yes. Wow. And and then so so from there on he he groomed and kind of took Mike under his wing. Explain to how you and Mike ended up getting involved through Customato. Well, Cus had always told Bill and Jim that because of the hundreds of thousands of dollars they were funding the training camp, Cus promised them that if they ever got a fighter, that would be promising that Jim and Bill would become the managers. Now, to me, Mike was nothing in 80, 81, 82, 83. Even after the Olympic trials, in 1984, Mike lost twice to Henry Tillman. Nobody thought Mike would be anything, but Cuss still saw the image. And once Mike became a pro, that's when I became involved in 1985. So do you think the trainer is 
probably the most pivotal person in a fighter's life to get them to where they want to go, especially someone like Mike that was a little bit of a misfit, you know, had a little bit of a, a background in, in, in criminal activity. And it took someone like Gus to bring it out of him. Do you think that um, it was because of Gus that Mike got to where he was? Uh, there's a definition that I attempt to instill in other people. The difference between trainer and teacher okay. is a huge difference. What is that? That is, if Sugar Ray Leonard walked into your office tomorrow, you'd be the greatest trainer in the world. But you could never take a kid who's 12 years old and make him into a fighter. Right. Cus can. And that's because Cus would know specific things. Every fighter on TV today has a left jab, has a right hand, has an uppercut, has a combination, can move to the left, move to the right. But there's two things they don't do ever in the history of boxing. They're never taught by trainers. They're never drilled into the fighters. And they're the two most important things ever. And when I tell you what they are, and you watch boxing from now on, you'll be shocked. You want to take a guess at what those two things are that cuss drilled. And when I say drilled, a thousand hours in front of a mirror, a thousand hours in front of the bag, a thousand hours under the pads that are never drilled into a fighter. Well, I would say head movement. How'd you know that? Well, you know, I've, I've kind of been, um, I don't want to say an expert on this subject, but I'm a huge fan. Okay. And it's, it's something that I, that, I, that I know that Mike Tyson mastered great, which combined with his hard punching power right. and the footwork. Well, it was, it's head motion. Yep. And believe it or not, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass. You're the first guy I ever spoke to who said that the first time off the bat. Head motion. If you and I walked into any gym in the history of boxing, a hundred years before today or a hundred years from now, you'll never hear a trainer drill the kid on moving his head ever. Number two is almost as important. Hands up. You'll never hear that. Hands up, hands up, hands up. Every fighter can do everything else. As I said, jab and jab and all those other things, but none of them keep their hands up and none of them move their head and head motion has to be done in a very specific way. So you're the first person to ever say head motion, and that's the most critical thing, not getting hit. Well, it's funny that I, the reason I said that is because um, during my boxing training, I found the head movement was one of the most difficult things that I had to try and incorporate into my training. Um, it's not something that's you know normal with the human body. Obviously, you're moving not to get hit, but to make it um, so smooth and, and, and like telepathic even, to the extent where Mike would move his head telepathically to the punches that were being thrown. Just incredible. Well, it all depends on when a fighter starts. Once a fighter begins training and fighting and becomes an amateur, has 100 amateur fights and becomes a young pro, it's impossible to get them to move their head because they have bad, bad habits. But if you took any kid who's eight or nine, 10 years old and put him in front of a mirror and just taught him head motion, in one hour, he'd be in master. It doesn't mean he's going to do it in the fight. Right. But he can do it perfectly in front of the mirror. But it has to be done from very first day. Because then he doesn't have any bad habits. Do you think that Mike's head movement was one of the greater parts of his success? That's a great question. And people don't understand that Mike got hit less moving forward into the range of the other guy than other great fighters got hit moving away and running right, away. exactly. And that that's, does two things. Number one, not getting hit gives you a lot of confidence, number one. Number two, you have to remember that the other person has a mentality also. They don't like the idea of throwing a punch, not landing, but getting hit in return. Yep. That's a tremendous plus to have in the back of your mind that the other person has never experienced. Right. That's what made Mike so powerful. Not, he was a good puncher, but the fact that he didn't get hit gave him so much confidence and took away the confidence of the other guy. Do you think that's kind of indicative with Floyd Mayweather as well? Another incredible point that you brought up with Floyd Mayweather, there are some fighters that are born with incredible natural physical ability. Some are not. Right. Muhammad Ali had it. Sugar Ray Leonard had it, Hector Camacho had it, Roy Jones had it. But they can do anything they wanted and still look great. Other fighters had to be taught specific things to look that good. They weren't natural. 
Floyd was born with like that stuff. You, you, you can't teach what he does. He was born with that. So while it may not be that exciting, it, he doesn't get hit because he was born with natural, God-given physical ability. Where does that come from, do you think? From God. It comes from God, right? It's, yes. like, it's like Michael Jackson was self-taught. You know what I mean? You didn't teach Michael Jackson how to dance. Maybe, you know what I mean? He just knew how to do it. You didn't uh, teach Floyd Mayweather how to duck those punches. He, j- he just did it. You didn't, you know, S- Celine Dion, she, you didn't teach her how to sing it. It'd just, be, it'd just her. So it's, it's, it's born in who you are, right? It's born. You can, some other fighters are born, and they're very mechanical. They're going to get hit with, there's some fighters that get hit with everything. Mm. Doesn't mean they're going to stop boxing. Doesn't mean they're going to quit. They keep coming. They get, keep getting hit. But you wonder why are they fighting so mechanically rather than athletically? So was Mike Tyson born with it, or do you think that um, Gus was the one that showed him how to do it? If that's a great question, if Mike did not have the drilling of the head motion the way he did, he, he might be driving a taxi in downtown Brooklyn somewhere. The fact that he never got hit was a huge plus. It gave him so much confidence. He may have still been a boxer. But he would have been in an average heavyweight. It was the head motion, number one, the hands up, number two. But don't underestimate the mental and emotional teaching that Cuss gave Mike. And that's very critical for a fighter. While it doesn't appear like that to the average viewer, the emotional status of a fighter is very critical. That's funny that you say that because... Um I mean, if you look at Mike Tyson's emotional state over the years, it's obviously been up and down. Some people would look at him as a psycho or a killer. Mm-hmm. Um, you're saying that, you know, part of the intelligence of fighting is that, is that you have to be on point with that. Do you think that, um, that, that Mike grew with that as he went on in his career? Because he always has been a little bit, oh, I've got to word this right without insulting anyone, um, over the edge. Well... I've heard that question about 20 million times. And I always counter by saying, well, he's over the edge. Why wasn't he over the edge from 1984 to 1988, being under more pressure than any athlete in the history of boxing? Well, that's the question, why wasn't he? Because there's, it has to do with the people around you. Right. Uh, There was an um, investor in New York named Bernie Madoff, who conned hundreds of people out of billions of dollars. They didn't want to be conned, he was a great con artist. Right. And Mike met incredibly great con artists after leaving Caton Jacobs and Kevin Bruni. Con artists like uh, Robin Givens, con artists like... Um, Don King. Don King. That yeah. were the two I was going to bring up. Yeah, the, and they're different in that they're masters of being con artists. There are some con artists that may try to steal some money out of your wallet, but you don't meet a con artist who's going to cut your throat, take your watch, then go have dinner, and then go to sleep. Pure sociopaths. They were masters of it. And Mike, uh, uh, like Bernie Madoff, was susceptible to great con artists. Because of what? Because of his um, immaturity in the business or just because of his um, forthcoming self? His, his, he, was just, he just believed what everyone was telling him? He was, well, well, why was he susceptible to that? Well, the last thing you mentioned he, believing everything was told yeah, him. Yeah. From 84 to 88, he met a lot of con artists. Yeah. But he still was perfect. Right. You, you know, when you're hired to do commercials for Pepsi Cola, like he did in Nintendo Video and Kodak Film, they don't usually hire guys who have bad demeanors or uh, demons in any way. And Mike was hired to be a spokesperson for the New York City Police Department, the FBI, the DEA. They don't usually hire guys who have bad reputations or bad personalities. Right. It takes the people around you. So the thing that put everything on a downslide was a perfect line of demarcation in 1988. Gee, what happened in 1988? It wasn't like Mike woke up one day in 1988 and said to himself, well, let's see, I'm heavyweight champion. I've got millions in the bank. Uh, I have millions in annuities. I'm doing commercials on TV. I'm a spokesperson, white people love me, black people love me. You know, I'd rather be the asshole of the century. That's not what happened. It was carefully and calculatingly planned. And what planned it and what started was Robin Givens lying about being pregnant. She saw dollar signs. Mike was dating some incredible women. 
she and her mother said, how do we get Mike? If you're pregnant, that will probably work. And it worked. And that's what's caused the whole world to crumble around Mike. So, well, that, that was coming up to my next question. Would you say that Robin Givens was one of the factors in the demise of Mike Tyson from his glory day? Uh, she was, I, I made one a, of the One of the reasons? Yeah. I, yeah. I made a huge mistake. Uh, Bill Caton, Mike's manager, I always said, well, Don King, you know, he destroyed Mike. He dest I, and Bill said, Steve, you have to remember one thing. It was Robin Givens who began the wedge between Mike and everyone else. Yep. And that permitted Don King to jump in. When Mike became emotionally unstable because of what Robert, why all of a sudden in 1988 did he become unstable in right. some way? Yeah. It was carefully and calculatingly planned by Robin because she knew that if he, she could put Mike in that state in a lawsuit, in a settlement, who would, <laughs> who would say he's not state? Look, he admitted it on TV. Uh, that was thing. horrible. That was horrible, that interview. I remember the that. The Barbara Walters oh, show. Oh, man. Okay. My heart was breaking for Mike because yeah. he just literally. Well, when you meet a great con artist, they can do things like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's a, a permitted uh, Don King to jump in. And mm. that was, that destroyed Mike. So that kind of just shows the innocence of Mike in a way as well. And maybe, maybe also shows what fueled his ferocity. Is that how you say it? Is ferocity. Ferocity. There you go. That fueled his ferocity is is being treated like that. Well, it all depends on who's around you. And you keep it, going back to that. I really yeah, like that what you say. It's, yeah. it's who's around you, right? Yeah. Well, young kids who are in public school, if they're surrounded by other kids who are really nice, mm. it kind of rubs off a little bit. Right. But if they're surrounded by kids who are have bad demeanors, that that's gonna rub off also. Right. But isn't it interesting that under tremendous pressure, eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight fighting these huge fights, no mom, no dad, under more pressure than anyone, the most valuable. He was as cool as a cucumber. But he and, had you, right? Well, there were weeks and months at a time he was on his own in California, in New York. He was living with me in my apartment, but he was off on his own. He could have done anything he wanted. That so was, when you say he was living with you in New York in your apartment? Yes. We in were a sure. little one-bedroom apartment? It was a one-bedroom apartment. He slept on the couch. I had the bedroom. He stayed there for uh, three years. In the, <laughs> it, yeah, in, in the beginning, it was only one day at a time because he was fighting every two weeks. Then as he got to be a six-round fighter, eight-round fighter, 10-round fighter, it was three days, then five days, then six days. And when he became champion, he would be there for a month before we had to go back to training. And uh, uh, for a guy like me to come out of the bedroom and there in the couch, is the heavyweight champion of the See, world. you're reading my mind right now. That was my question. It was like, when you wake up in the morning and go make a cup of coffee, and then you look over onto the couch, and then you see the the greatest fighter of all time sitting there, that's got to be like, that's got to fucking blow your mind. Like, I'm making my Nescafe, and, oh, hang on a minute, there's Mike Tyson on the couch. Yeah. Uh, when he was living uh, in my apartment, th there was no pressure, because he wasn't under pressure. The pressure was the six weeks of training here in Vegas before each fight. With the press, my responsibilities were the press, the sparring partners, the travel, the licensing, the medicals, all the interviews to make sure. The one thing I didn't want to happen was to get a call from the managers in New York to say, Steve, did you read the New York Times yesterday? I would die. Once I heard them talk, like I would die. You know, everything that Mike was asked to do during that time period, even if he didn't want to do it, he did it. Still. He did it yeah. because he knew it wasn't coming from me, and it really we, it wasn't even coming from Kate and Jake. It was coming from Customato. Right. So in his mind, he said, "If that's what's being told to me, it's got to be the right thing." Right. And the bottom line is, interestingly enough, every decision made for Mike from 1980 to 1988 resulted in something positive for Mike, and then after '88. Every decision made for Mike resulted in something negative for Mike. Mm. That line of demarcation of Robin Givens, that's, just, that's a line of demarcation. So, like, everyone's, everyone's hearing us talking about your association with Mike and he was sleeping on your couch. What was your actual role in his life from that time period? Because you were there f probably for a lot of the glory years, man. You were there in the corner. You were there at the fights. You were there in the change room. You were there afterwards. Uh, explain exactly what your role was. Yeah. I was very fortunate in that when 
Jacobs and Caton, the managers, had these two great champions, uh, Wilfred Benitez and Edwin Rosario, I knew they didn't want to babysit the fighters for the weeks before each fight. It means watching the training, the sparring partners, then sitting around. It was, I did that. And it was good experience so that when Mike finally turned pro, early on, Cuss was there. But once Cuss passed away, Jim and Bill said, Steve, you're going to be the guy who handles that stuff. So Jim and Bill did the business on the phone with HBO or foreign sales, and international monies. And they, they would say to me, Steve, we got the fight for August 3rd against Tony Tucker. The moment they said that, Mike was my responsibility. Now, your responsibility as far as what? Diet, training, press, being a good boy, not drinking too much. Was that all part and part of what you had to do? Some of that was, I'd say most of that was under Mike's control himself. Really? Yeah. He, the diet was no problem. His demeanor was no problem. It's all of the things that seem inconsequential, but every detail has to be followed to the perfect letter of the law. First things lining up six or eight sparring partners. I've got some records that say, a sparring partner says, I want no part of Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, on, I showed that to HBO, they couldn't believe it. Wow. Oh, they, they were getting $2,500 a week each to spar with Mike. And how many spars a week would they have with him? They, we'd have sometimes six to eight sparring partners a week. And they'd all get knocked out? Well, none of them got knocked out, but it was Mike's job to do specific things right. as per Kevin Rooney. Okay, so, got it. Sparring partners, their travel, getting them to Las Vegas. Mike and his trainer, Las Vegas. All of the interviews, all of the press, all of the medicals, all of the interviews, day by day, making sure. There, it's not, it wasn't brain surgery, but it's still the pressure of knowing that the entire world is watching everything you do. So it's one thing if you're a car mechanic and you're trying to fix a car and you bust up the engine, well, you and the customer know that. But if the entire world know that you busted up the engine, it feels a little bit different. For some reason, they made me responsible for being responsible for the world's most valuable sports personality. What and the, you know, now, I never showed that to Mike. I would be very normal because I didn't want to instill in Mike anything that looked like it was uh, pressure. Wow. The, more than he had. Wow. So I, I hit it. You know, I would joke, uh, this and that, and we do this. But I was dying. Now, yeah, I don't, now you I could don't, cover yeah. that for him? Like, he, he wasn't aware of all that pressure because of no. the way that you were kind of mentoring him through that journey? Yeah, I would, didn't even have to mentor. I just had to do all the other stuff. Wow. He handled his business, the training, the eating, you know, 99% uh, of the time. Everything was great. I screwed up a few times, and I tell you, Getting a call from New York, I'd rather Mike slap me in the face than get a call from Jacobs or Caton and say, did you, do, did you speak to ESPN yesterday? Right away I knew I was dead. <sighs> right away I knew I was dead. Yeah. And how do you deal with that? Well, uh, I knew that it's like having a, uh, a, a, in the film, uh, Hannibal Lecter is coming to visit you. You know, I'd rather have Hannibal Lecter come visit me than to get a call from Jacobs and Caton and say, did you say that to ESPN? You know, you know and, and could it be something so measly as well? Like something that didn't even mean anything that they could have. Uh, yeah, I said, I said something stupid. Exactly what it was, was in an ESPN interview, I told the interviewer that Mike was going to be so great that it's embarrassing. I'm sorry that he's going to make people forget about Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. When, when they heard that, they drilled me, Steve, these are legends. How stupid can you... Okay, they, okay, but by you know the what? way, they were always very low-key. They would never yell or scream. Yeah, they yeah. would always say, Steve, how can you say something? These are legends. You know? Well, to be honest with you, Steve, because you were kind of right in a way. Listen, they are legends. But when you talk about legends, Mike Tyson is also classified in that group of people for you to say that is maybe um you know you were you were foreseeing what the future was to come you were around this man 24 7 so maybe even caught up in the whole emotion and, and greatness of mike tyson you're like fuck man this is my guy you're gonna make he's gonna make everyone forget about so i can kind of understand that D do you think that you got caught up in the whole superstar of mike tyson when you were with him or was it more like a, a brother or a father-son relationship it was something a little different. It was plain stupidity on my part. 
plain stupidity. In what way? It, it would be great if the press said that, yeah. but not for me. Right. I'm going to give you the exact opposite of that. Uh, Mike fought a heavyweight championship against Larry Holmes. Larry said disparaging things about Mike before the fight. Larry had knocked out Muhammad Ali, and Ali said to Mike, I'd like you to get him for it. Mike scored a knockout. Yep. Mer Larry Merchant, the HBO commentator, is coming into the ring. I thought maybe, maybe Mike may say something derogatory that would be offensive about Larry Holmes. Why would you think that? Uh, because that... of the way Larry treated Mike before the fight. And Mike was stewing on that, and that, that, that kept on with him? Well, he kept on with him, but he was smart enough. I think he would have been okay on his own. Yeah. On his own. But, I, but my job was to see that everything went right, and I don't want to take chances with something like that on national television. Yeah. So I call Mike to the corner. I say, I know how you feel about Larry, but it would be great for you to say, now this is not just Mike and one other person. This is the entire world watching. Right. It would be great for you to say Larry was a great fighter. You're sad you had to fight him. At his best, you would not have stood a chance. And Mike looked at me and said, uh, he gave me the merchant comes over. Maybe the second question was about Larry Holmes. Mike said he was a great fighter. I'm sad I had to fight him. At his best, I would not have stood a chance. And then on his own, he threw and he was the greatest fighter of our time. Now, people at home are going, holy mackerel. This guy just knocked out Larry Holmes, and here he is praising him that he was a better. That's what the job was. And that was your job, right? That, because without you saying that, he wouldn't have said that. I don't know. what. I think he would have been complimentary. I, I think he would. I think he would have had enough. Uh, uh, championship quality in him, in him, yeah. to be complimentary and say it was a tough fight. Larry was tough, but I'm glad I won. But I wanted to make sure or try to add something even more special. The objective of a manager is to make the fighter look as good as possible in any way, shape, or form, in any endeavor, in any way, shape, or form, no matter whether it's inconsequential or big. On national TV, you want to make a fighter look good. Yeah. Yep, and, and, and it worked, right? It, well, let's put it this way. I never asked anyone how it sound, yeah. but no one said that was silly of him to say that. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, he, he has said stuff that was silly, but he said a lot of stuff that's been great also. He's actually the world, in my opinion, the world's greatest historian on boxing. Oh, he he his knows brain, his stuff, man. Yeah. But not only boxing, brain power. Um, uh, he was doing an interview on 60 Minutes on one of his one-man shows that he was doing about five, six years ago. And 60 Minutes was interviewing him about a few days before the show. And the interviewer from uh, 60 Minutes said to Mike, uh, Mike, you've, been quite, you know, you've become quite a thespian. And the interviewer said, you probably don't know what that means. And Mike said, yeah, thespa. He was one of the great first actors from Greece. The interviewer looked at Mike and said, how the, how the yeah. heck do you know that? Yeah, his, his, his word vocabulary and his yeah. articulation is, is... His intellect, whatever he's into, mm. into he becomes brilliant at. You know? can, we, can we just play a bit of a... Can we play some um, background stuff of Mike on the... You spin a clip in there? Let's just put some stuff in there. So, so the glory is... What, what, were you, what would you say where the glory is for Mike Tyson? Because the glory is seem like they might be coming back up again with these uh, new talks of him fighting again. Let's talk about those early days... They were the glory years, right? People were only for... I mean, this was... Total fights, 58-50 by knockout. Um, Hector Mercedes, what was it? Back in 1985. So you would have been around in these days, brother. Yes. Uh, actually, the Mercedes fight uh, was the very, his very first fight. I was not at this fight. I was still in New York City. To me, Mike was still nothing in my mind. I was not wise enough to understand how, Mike, how good Mike was right. going to become. Uh, but uh, uh, Mike was going to become that good. Um, uh, th there's a difference between having glory days and being loved and adored. Right. Okay. So you know, a lot of people can know who you are, but you're not loved and adored. You know? Yeah. So, 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 do you think that because he went through the ups and downs and trials and tribulations of fame, going through being being the glory days and then having all this money and then kind of going to jail and being accused of all these horrendous crimes? Do you think that affected the legacy of Mike Tyson, or do you think that it's coming back in now? Uh, it affected him tremendously. Yeah. Uh, it's not like Mike is a robot. He has emotions like anyone else. Yeah. If, uh, uh, you know, you're, if, if anything, everything in your life is great. Uh, your house is paid off. Your car is paid off. Your kids are in college. Uh, your wife is doing great. She's been made of a president of a company. Somebody cuts you off as you're driving. Somebody cuts you off. 
you start to say, hey, well, no, forget it. You know, everything in my life is great. But if everything in your life is bad, you just lost your job, your car's being repossessed, your money in your house, your kids just flunked out of school, your wife is having a physical problem. Now someone cuts you off. You go ape shit. You go ape shit, okay? Yep. So with Mike, when everything was right, he was mentally, emotionally calm. But when everything was going wrong because of the people around him, it wasn't like he can turn it off like a switch. He knew what it was like to be loved and adored. Now you have to know that being human, he wasn't feeling that way. Right. People were disparaging him yep. because of the way he was acting. It didn't happen by accident. It was placed there. I suppose when you're a human being, we go through all these kind of things. But when you're as big of a, spa, uh, a star as Mike Tyson, you know the whole world is focused on everything that you're doing. So something that you know he may have done um, that the whole world can see is it, something that normal that, that the normal people would have done. I, I, I kind of find it. It's kind of a little sad in a way because I, f I feel that maybe Mike was taken advantage of a little bit in the sense of I don't want to say he was. Uh, Immature. I just want to say that maybe he was just such a, uh, as we mentioned before, he just believed what everyone was saying, and and then I think that the whole the whole fame and fortune of becoming who he was, kind of fueled the deep seated anger that he had inside, which maybe caused a few problems. Do do you think that um, it was the uh, substances that that kind of helped towards that as well? Because I mean, we know that Mike delved into substances later on in the past come out of that, which is amazing. A lot of people don't come out of substance abuse and going through all that money that he went through. Do you see that this is a second life for Mike maybe coming through now? Not, not a second life. That's a bad way of putting it. A, a revamp of his old glory days of him being that absolute animal that we couldn't wait for the Mike Tyson fight. There's another one about to come up. Do you think it's going to be the same? Well, first of all, when you mentioned the old days, yeah, I keep it, saying that yeah, because, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah and, but it's, it's something that's much simpler, is that Cuss knew that deep down Mike had good intentions. Yeah. Now, how do I know that? Well, 84 to 88. You were there. Well, I always challenge people. I say, are you a betting person? They say, yeah. If, would you bet a, hundred, a dollar to win 100? They say, yeah, I'd bet a dollar to win. You show me one interview, one press conference, one photograph, anything from 84 to 88, that demonstrated in any way, shape, or form that Mike acted improperly in any way. They have no answer nah, for that. No, that's okay. right. Isn't that unusual that from 84 to 88, being under more pressure than any athlete, maybe Joe Lewis fighting the second uh, Schmeling fight before World War II or Jesse Owens and running. At a young age, at such a young age Jenny, too. Jesse Owens running in front of Hitler. Mike under that pressure with no problems. Then all of a sudden they start. What? Why did they just start in 88? It wasn't, as I said, that he woke up one day. It was carefully and calculatingly planned. And that bothered Mike. Now, it didn't happen by accident. It's like, once again, a heart surgeon. These con artists, Robin Givens and Don King, were heart surgeons about how to destroy someone for their own benefit. It did not happen by accident. Now, getting back to today, uh, Mike is still very well known. He's a celebrity. Um, uh, he still is a very vicious fighter uh, because when you watch the clips of him on TV... The recent clips? Yeah, they're scary, okay? Very scary. Very scary. And the, probably the objective is whoever's putting up the money for this event is looking toward the future in that Mike will probably do very well. And do a couple more after it. No. You don't think so? No. Really? We're, yeah, no. It's diff you're, you're close, but you're not quite accurate. What will happen is, once Mike does very well, whoever's in control of the money behind this particular fight will go right to one of the organizations and say, how much to put Mike in the top 10? Once Mike gets in the top 10, he can fight for the championship. Because what you don't want to do is go from this particular fight and risk a $100 billion fight. Fuck, I need okay. to have a drink after that. Hang on a second. Okay. It's in other words, you have to think about what's best for the fight and the investor the investor he has a choice putting mike in where he could get cut anything can happen or putting mike in a fight against tyson fury or these uh, deontay wilder and it'll be the biggest fight in the history of boxing uh but if you lose so you walk away with 250 million bucks
That's yeah. what the investor is thinking. Mike could spend that easy. Well, uh, he's done it before. <laughs> uh, he, he, yeah, he, he's. I think he's being much more careful now with yeah. his money. I mean, yeah. I heard that he would give out stacks of hundred dollar bills to people just off the bat, like friends, people, everyone, everyone, just stacks of hundred dollar bills and giving this money away. Um, it's, it's it's very chilling what you say about that. That uh, he could go for the championship at fifty three years old because he's well, still. Well, you have. To, in my opinion. In your opinion, but right. I think in a lot of people's opinion. Well, in a, forget his factor for a okay. second. The champions today, the heavyweight champs. Yeah, it's not that they're good; it's just that they're so damn big. Yeah, the okay? size of them. Yeah. You're right. Uh, I, I don't know if you watch um, uh, basketball the, at all. Okay, you get the top basketball team in the world, and each guy's six six, six seven, six eight, and they're the champions. But if they fight a team where each guy's eleven foot seven, they're yeah. gonna have a problem. Yeah. Even if the other team is just average, they're gonna have a problem. Yeah. These guys today. I don't want to disparage them. They, they're brave, the heavyweights. They're brave. They try. They've got heart. They've got courage. They have athleticism. But their techniques are so incredibly poor that Mike has a definite shot. They've never been hit by somebody like Mike Tyson, okay, especially in the early rounds. So are you saying that someone like Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury, if given the opportunity to step into the ring with Mike Tyson – they would have problems with that in the first early rounds? Yes. They'd have definitely even, even Mike being 53 years old? Yes, because especially those first early rounds, they've never seen punches come at them like that. They've always been playing a game of chess for the first couple of rounds. And each one of them are playing this game. Mike doesn't play that game of chess. And he knows he's got this spirit that's saying, I can, I want, I'm going to show the world what I am. He's that type of guy because of Customato knowing that people want to be entertained. That's why the UFC has done the, such a spectacular job, but not spectacular. It's more entertaining for the younger crowd to watch somebody get their eyes bit out or their nose broken off or their ear bit than to see round eight or nine yeah. in a boxing match where yeah. two guys are playing around. Okay? Mm -hmm. So for Mike, it's like there's a film that you might have seen, Steven Spielberg's first film, Jaws. Of course. Okay. You never knew what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. With these guys today, you know what's going to happen. Right. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. With Mike, you don't know what's going to happen right. with his punching power. That's why it'll draw not the boxing crowd, mainstream. It would if draw could, mainstream. Yeah. Mainstream is what you want to draw yeah. for a sport or any endeavor. You draw the mainstream, that's where the money comes from. I mean, because even the talk about Mike fighting again now, it's building up such a, an excitement in the... Um, combat sports world that um, people are just so looking forward to seeing him get in there again. Um, is that is that because of just the legend that he is? I mean, I look around the room here and like like that picture right behind you right there yes. of Mike Tyson. Mm. It's just so ferocious yeah. and it's just a killer instinct. People want to see that, right? Especially from old time legends like him. Well, you want to see, you want to be entertained. There are some films that are wonderfully dramatic but they're not entertaining, okay? The top 10 films in theaters before all the junk happened outside, Raiders, uh, Raiders films, Star Wars, uh, um, Supernatural, vampire stuff, because that's entertaining for the mainstream, for the young crowd. Bigfoot. You big, whatever it is, okay? <laughs> but there's gonna be one Titanic film every, every century that mm. comes along that people see as dramatic and makes that type of money. For the young audience today, their attention span is very short. Yeah. They want to be entertained. Now, with Mike, having been out of boxing for such a long time, this first fight is going to be very critical, this exhibition. If he comes out there smoking and throwing bombs, that's going to make his next fight the champion, a championship fight where people don't know what's going to happen. That's always interesting for the crowd. When you go into a fight, watch a fight, and you know there's going to be boxing for eight or nine rounds, well, that's okay, you're a fight fan. But for the mainstream to be on the edge of their seats where they, the wife comes into the husband and says, oh, dinner's ready. Hold on. Uh, Mike is on TV. I'll be in it about yeah. 20. That's the way it was. You know, you, there was a great film called Hoosiers about a basketball team, little mm -hmm. team fighting a huge team from Indiana. And when the game took place in the streets of Hickory, where the little team was, they used to have on theaters these big marquees with the name of the film and the actors, the marquee in this film, Hoosier said, closed for a big game. Wow. Okay, 
Now, when Mike fights for the title, That's close you're to not going to get taxis. Yeah. Yeah, nine, you won't be right. able to get a taxi. Right. Everyone's going to be watching TV because they don't know what's going to happen. Do you think calling it an exhibition fight is downplaying the seriousness of the bout? Um, I, I wouldn't put a, a, any credence on it because Mike carries so much weight. Whether you call it an exhibition, a fight, a demonstration, a sparring session, no one's watching for the uh, name. Of, they're watching Mike Tyson. If it was anybody but Mike Tyson, you'd have trouble... You know, you'd have to have Jennifer Lopez as the referee to get yeah. anybody to watch. I keep, I keep hearing you mention Jennifer Lopez. That's like the ninth time you've mentioned her. Do you, you guys got something going on? Do I have to call A-Rod right now? What the hell? No. Well, we have something going on in my dreams. Yes. It's, <laughs> you know, uh, it's been quite active, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And by the, by the way, like boxing, I always come out on top. <laughs> So these are the jokes that we were having prior to coming yeah. on, on, on today. Yeah. We were having a lot of jokes about this, about Viagra yeah. and I don't know what else, Bigfoot, yeah. yeah. fucking Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. It's all stemmed yeah. into this. I tried to offer him a whiskey before, but he didn't want to have one, but yeah. that's okay. Too tough. Uh, too tough for you. Yeah. Chardonnay for next time. Yes, a weak Chardonnay. A weak Chardonnay. Yeah. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of photos. So this, this is a really funny photo of me and Mike. Um, this photo right here, I'll put it up. Can you? Lovely. So this was this is me and my lovely fiance. We went to Mike's uh, stage show mm -hmm. at the MGM, and the, and 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 the reason why me and Mike are laughing in that photo is because my fiance was like, "Oh my god, you stink like weed!" And then me and Mike just cracked up instantly and started laughing. We took that photo. Here's another one from um, the Undisputed Truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw that show, um, Steve. Yes, it, it was Mike's stand-up show there, yeah. which which is kind of really. Really amazing. So I've had some great experiences with Mike. Uh, he, he he autographed this glove, oh, lovely. this glove for me. And, um, you know, as someone that's been a huge fan of Mike Tyson, just to have you in here today and talking about these insights has yeah. just really, really fascinated yeah, me. I, and I love the way he praised it. He wrote it to you, to my favorite asshole from Mike Tyson. <laughs> you know? uh, it was very lovely of him to do that. You know, it's very personal, you know. Uh, I <laughs> <laughs> that was the third one he signed for me. <laughs> he wrote fuckwit on the first one. <laughs> By the way, you mentioned about the weed, okay? Now, Mike was living with me for three years. Was sir. he smoking it back in those days? I had tons of wine in my apartment. I never saw him drink once in any way, shape, or form. Not once. Not in my apartment. Not in restaurant. Never once. Why? Because it was too much fun to be heavyweight champ and be a hero. Too much fun. And the discipline. And he always would think, what would Cuss say? What would Cuss do right now? He would say that? He would say that? In his mind. In his mind, yeah. yeah. he'd say, what would, you know, no, that Cuss would say, um, uh, Cuss, can I have a drink? Well, Mike, uh, do you think Joe Lewis would have a drink at this point? Well, no, no, I, okay, you know. Uh, and that's what gave Mike such great respect for these fighters was Cuss's love. For these fighters, Cus adored these fighters, and that's what permeated Mike's mind. And do you think that uh, Mike still reflects back onto those days with Cus and, and and uses those things that he taught him? Well, I don't know because I don't spend much. I haven't spent much time with Mike. He's in different businesses now. I'm sure he handles his life in a way that is custom model like because he's doing very well. Yeah. Uh, but he still has cuss in his mind emotionally. It's very tough when someone does something very special for you. Yeah. All those like years. Like you did for Mike. Well, for me, he knew that if I, if there was no cuss, there would be no me. If there was no Mike Tyson, I would not be sitting here with you. But Mike knew that if there was no cuss, his life would have taken a different turn. So he's very indebted to cuss, uh, for not only the boxing, but for the, uh, information about how to handle life, how to handle life. That's more important than the boxing. And Cus would always say that uh, that the fighter succeeded when he no longer uh, needed Cus. That's when the fighter really succeeded. And at one point, Mike no longer needed Cus to be around. So, so would you say that you said that you haven't spoke to Mike for a while? That's correct. Is that because you guys aren't friends anymore? You guys have had a fallout? You call him on the phone every now and then? What's, what's the deal with that? Well, uh, number one, I believe he lives in, in uh, California, but he's got these wonderful businesses now, like the marijuana farm. Right. The one-man show took up a tremendous amount of time effort. He has to have a tremendous amount of courage. I would not have the courage to get on stage and talk about 
my life and things like he did. So it's, we've gone different paths. So would you say that if you called him up right now and said, let's go and have a coffee, would it happen or not? Uh, I would try to reach him out. I, I adore him. You know, I adore him. So you still, you still feel the love for Mike Tyson that you have yeah. since back in the 80s? Yeah, it, it's very tough. I do a lot of film editing for yeah. YouTube and Facebook. And when I watch these scenes of, of him, especially, there's no way to uh, describe the feeling of coming out of the dressing room with Mike Tyson, walking down the aisle. To 30,000 uh, people. And then again, getting in the ring <sighs> with him. The... The idea of it was such a wonderful feeling of being in that role. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's one thing if you're dealing with a guy named Johnny Jenkins who's 10 and 10, but when you have Mike Tyson walking in the ring, it was such a wonderful time. Yeah. So you can feel that energy when you're standing behind Mike Tyson in the corner there, when he comes out from that first round and you know, oh shit, there's going to be 10 seconds left and it's all over and done with. Can you feel that energy? Can you feel that power? It was worse. It's what you can feel it in your ball sack, I was right? I was dying. You were dying on the inside, yeah. 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 You know, not. I, I was always thinking of the managers. They would never blame me. Once Mike's in the ring, he's on his own. That's it. That's that, right. He was, at, he was on his own. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, most fighters, 99% of them, when they spar, usually their fights, they fight a little better than they do in sparring. They hold back a little bit. Mike in sparring was a thousand percent better than his fighting. A thousand, if he ever sp fought in a professional fight like he fought in sparring, they would bar him from, sp from fighting. He would be too vicious. So yeah. I, I see your face get a little kind of emotional when we talk about, you know, your situation with Mike right now. Do, do you feel a little bit of a loss that you guys aren't, you know, like you were in the past. Is there something there that, 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 that kind of breaks your heart a little bit? Well, it's, it's like uh, your mom and dad or a brother that you spent a lot of time with yeah. and not seeing them anymore. And um, it's, it's tough because you love them so much. Sleeping, you know, having the same apartment. Uh, um, it's always interesting when parents talk about waking up in the morning and watch, going to the kid's bedroom and watching their children sleep. I would come out of my bedroom and just stand there for a minute and just watch him sleep. On it your would, couch? On in my New couch. York, in your one-bedroom apartment? There's the heavyweight champ, my, my <sighs> friend. You know. Wow. Also, he was the best friend you could ever have. The best. He would be very untrusting of 99% of the people because Cus was like that. But if he was your friend, he would go to the ends of the earth. There were times that he would come to my uh, 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 help when I was emotionally distraught, usually over women, and he would say, sit me down, he would sit me down, you know, take time from his life to help me. Uh, so as a friend, you couldn't ask for a better friend. I see it in your face when you talk about him, man. I see the love that you have for that guy. Yeah. I, I see your eyes welling up a little bit, and, and, and I can feel that, you know, you still have a lot of love and, and, and care for him. If there was something that you could say to him right now, what would it be? Uh, it would say, I, I would say, continue on as you're doing. You're doing great. You know, uh, everything is going well. You've got businesses. You're going to do sensational against Roy, uh, Roy Jones, and you're going to be heavyweight champion of the world again. And that's going to be the time wow. that's going to be very special for you, Mike, wow. being heavyweight champion of the world and conducting yourself like a, you were, another Joe Lewis, another Jack Dempsey, another Rocky Marciano. Do you, do you, see, your, do you see yourself matching and meeting up with Mike again in the future? Oh, I, I would love that. I would love that. You know, uh, it, it's something oh, it's where it's like not seeing your brother after he comes back from World War II and yeah. seeing them for the first time in four years. You know, and you see those scenes on TV, yeah. how emotional they are, you know, yeah. uh, especially after you've been through all of that pressure together. He knows what it was like in those years, 84 to 88, the pressure. It's not like he forgot it, you know. Uh, he has enough discipline not to reflect on that. Yeah. Because that would be a little odd for him to do that. Now he's drilling on what's happening now with his family. He's got kids. That's a huge responsibility. Yeah, right. I don't even have a puppy. I wouldn't even know how to deal with a puppy. He's dealing with children, and he's doing sensational with that. So that's, that's you know, he's doing great. He's doing great. You know? 
Um, you know, I just see and I feel that you're such a good guy. I can feel your spirit and your energy from here. And, and, and I can understand why Customato and, and Mike Tyson had you around for so many years. Because you seem like a really genuine, honest guy that, that's not here to fuck anyone over, that's not here to get gain, that you're just there for the love and, and, and for the care of someone else. So I can definitely see you and, and, and Mike reuniting in the future. And I would love to see that. You know, coming up, we've got some amazing boxes that are coming on the show. I would love to have you in as a co-host to talk to these guys. Was yeah. that, is that something you'd be interested in doing? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I have to admit, I, I rarely watch boxing today uh, because uh, I, I'm, I'm a little spoiled for 30 you, years. Yeah, you were spoiled from being back in the, in the heyday, my brother. That was great. But for 10 hours a day watching Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey, Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, Bo Jack, Ike Williams, Henry Armstrong, Wow. It's tough to watch that. It's like dating Jennifer Lopez and then having to date Jenny Jenkins. It's very tough. <laughs> okay, who's Jenny Jenkins? Yeah, I want to know who Jenny yeah, Jenkins she is. Lives, is she, she a porn star? She lives outside of Des Moines. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. She drives a taxi. But, you know, some of her, you know, it's like, like a guy says to you, I want you to meet my girl, this woman. She's beautiful. I say, do you have any pictures? No, but she's beautiful. Yeah. That's a little scary, yeah. okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, the love and adoration I have for these fighters, yeah. and you have to remember that besides you and me, very few people who know who Sugar Ray Robinson was. Right. Yeah. Very few people. Oh, no. So uh, uh, I'm lucky in that I remember these fighters. Yeah. Uh, the fighters today, I do know very little about. Can we I, roll that clip of that, that yeah. last fighter, that the young um, Ryan Garcia? Have you seen this guy? Um, I, I don't think so. Okay, so this guy here, um, he's a Latino fighter from America. He is, uh, I think he's 19 and 0 with 17 first round knockouts. Mm -hmm. And this didn't happen when he was fighting those other guys. Oh. Well, uh, right away, I like the f way he kept his hands up after the punch. Let's see what he does now. Uh, no, he's dropping his hands now a little bit. What he has is tremendous athletic ability. And, and he's aggressive. That's, that's good. But the left hand, see how it comes down after the jab? Yeah. You want, you want to come right back to your jaw to protect yourself from getting hit. He's uh, got some, keep it going, keep it going. He's got some severe punching power, and um, it's, it, it clips them and just drops them real quick. It's kind of like that Conor McGregor left hand. You know, that just grazes yeah. you when you go down. Right. See, what he did just then was he kept his hands up, but he was moving backward. Right. That's not as intimidating to the other fighter as right. standing right where you are, moving your head and punching back. Right, which, okay. is, which is another thing that, um, once again, obviously he's great at. This is something that Connor's good at as well, fighting forwards, fighting backwards. Um, well, Ryan Garcia's got that amazing, yeah. that amazing right hook there. Right, but you don't want to fight going backwards yep. because that takes away from your aura. Yeah, you want to always go forward. You want to be the guy hitting eighty home runs a year. Yeah, okay, yep. all the time. Um, so, do you think that the new generation of fighter is different to the old generation of fighter? And if so, what way? Uh, there's one particular way in that back in the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, there were so many gymnasiums, uh, uh, boxing gyms, and each gym had so many fighters that they pushed themselves to very higher levels on their own. Right. And when you have a lot more um, uh, competition and a lot more well of fighters, some of them could become really good. Yeah. The number of gyms have dropped down dramatically, which means the number of fighters have dropped down dramatically. They all still have tremendous will, heart, courage, drive, determination, but they don't have enough of that early experience to push them to that level. Uh, I would not bet against any of these guys against the older guys. But uh, the older guy, the guys from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s just had much more experience fighting tough guys yep. all the time. I'll tell you what, man. I, you know, when I started this podcast, I just wanted to talk to people that had amazing, interesting stories. As I mentioned at the top of the show, some people may know who you are. Some mm -hmm. people may know. The police, not, know, the police know who I am. The, <laughs> the police and yeah. the FBI know yeah. who Steve that, Lott is. That, that two kilos of heroin was not a big deal. Was, I'm real serious, you know. Yeah, yeah. The cocaine they were concerned about. Yeah. <laughs> the cocaine. <laughs> well, look. I, all I'm going to say is, man, it's just it's just been so inspiring to mm. talk to you. It's good to get the inside information, you know, on things that people maybe didn't know. You know, the fact that people didn't know that Mike slept on your couch, that they didn't know that he was so completely disciplined. So, 
Thanks very much for coming on the podcast today. And as I mentioned earlier on, we are going to be getting some really great fighters in here. And I would love you to come in and co-host with me because your expertise is second to none. You know more about boxing than the encyclopedia. And I would just love you to come in again. Yeah, I'd be more interested in their thinking process Absolutely. than what they did in the ring. Absolutely. That, to me, that's more important. Yeah. So Conor McGregor, his, I always bring up Conor because he's one of my favorite fighters. Right. His thinking process is probably one of the um, most uh, uh, definite parts of his skill that that keeps him on point do you do you follow mixed martial arts or the ufc i don't but in watching the way connor fights it's not i don't want to use the word easy it indicates to me that he has no fear it's always good to go into a, um, a process a endeavor where you have no fear every fighter believe it or not has some fear i wouldn't use the word fear but intimidation they're nervous Every celebrity, a piano player just doesn't get up there and play. A baseball player just doesn't get up. Now, they control it. They're professionals. They do their thing. Fighters have fear just like everyone else, but after all of the competition they go through, they control it like the fighter you just mentioned. Ryan Garcia. Connor has very little intimidation in him. Why is that? Uh, you got to be born like that. Is it because he's Irish? Well, whatever it is, it's part of being born like that. And no one can take that left-hand shot of his, right? Hey, you know, you have to have that, you know. Some fighters are incredibly athletic, but emotionally they're very weak. That's a bad combination. You know what, guys? I keep saying this. I'm just so happy to talk to all these amazing people because not only do I learn the process of things along the way, but I also get to have these amazing conversations with these with these great people. Steve, is there anything that you'd like to say on a positive note to everybody out there that's watching or listening on Spotify um, on, a depart, on a parting note? Yes, you owe me five bucks for this visit. <laughs> Michael's got that. I, I, <laughs> and a cash. I don't take checks. I got you on the cash, brother. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, on What Happens Here, you're watching the amazing Mr. Steve Lott. Today's episode was sponsored by... Founders Coffee, the most tasteable, the most delectable coffee here in Las Vegas. You can catch it on Decatur right across the road from Ikea. All you got to do is drop the promo code WHH for 10% off your offer. We're also sponsored by the Ultimate Fight Week Retreat. That's every single year here in Las Vegas. Get to come down and learn about fighting, and it's just a great experience. Also, <laughs> this is another favorite one of mine. Baller balm for when your beard needs to be money. I'm going to give you one of these, Steve, because you can put it on your balls. All right. Well, then you need a smaller can. <laughs> <laughs> That's the smallest I've got. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, okay. Steve. My pleasure. Thanks, brother. Okay. <laughs>